Good evening, friends. We welcome you to the second session of 2023. Good evening, friends. We welcome you for the second technical session of 2023. The topic of today's uh, session is integrated development of port and marine infrastructure, shipbuilding and repair capabilities. The presentation will be made by Dr. Joshin John from Accelerate Kochi. Kochi. We, we are very honored to have him because he has done quite a lot of work despite being quite a young gentleman. Uh, as a chief guest, we have uh, Mr. Umesh Grover, who doesn't need any introduction. And we have today as a session chair, Dr. Shija Janardhanan. So I'll briefly, uh, you know, kind of present Dr. Janardhanan uh, CV or brief resume. Dr. Shija Janardhanan is the head of School of Naval Architecture and Ocean Engineering, Indian Maritime University, Vishakhapatnam campus. She has a PhD in numerical ship hydrodynamics from IIT Madras in 2010. Earlier, she worked as a professor and head of the Department of Mechanical Engineering, ACMS School of Engineering and Technology, Ernakulam, Kerala, and also as a surveyor in the Research and Rural Development Division of Indian Register of Shipping, Mumbai. Her, uh, her research interests include controllability of surface ships, underwater robotics, vibration of risers, computational fluid dynamics, a whole lot of them actually. She is the editor of the book, Advances in Visualization and Optimization Techniques for Multidisciplinary Research, Lecture Notes in Mechanical Engineering, Springer Nature, Germany. She has been an invited speaker in the International Conference in, on Advanced Computational Engineering and Experimentation and was elevated to the level of senior organizer, special session 11 on visualization in multidisciplinary engineering in 2019. She has about 50 publications to her credit and also served as a reviewer to the journals published by Elsevier, Springer and Taylor and Francis. She was appointed as a technical committee member of IR class Indian Register of Shipping during 2021 and 2022. With this brief introduction, I hand over the session to Dr. Shija Janardhanan. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Das Gupta. That was a generous introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, let me ask one basic question that always comes online. Am I heard? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah. Yes, you're, you're audible. Yes, very much. Thank you. Then I take this opportunity to introduce two important people of this uh, session, this INA session today. I begin with the chief guest. We have with us, we are extremely privileged to have with us Mr. Umesh Grover. Uh, Umesh Grover, a 1967-71 DMET graduate marine engineer, served SEI for 39 years with SEI, uh, 14 years on board the ships and 25 years ashore. Thereafter, he worked in several senior positions in the port and logistics sector and has now been in the industry for over 50 years. He was entrusted with various key positions in SEI, including head of container business, Director Technical, Shipbuilding and Acquisition, Sale and Purchase, Offshore Fleet Management, Project Planning, Business Development and IT. He was also the chairman of the renowned IPBCC Karmohom Conference and trustee on board of Tutikorin Port Trust. He was also chairman of BIS Shipbuilding Committee for a period of seven years. While at SCI, his team focused and worked for the acquisition of all types of vessels, tankers, bulk carriers, container ships, and offshore fleets. Um, and his efforts uh, result in an unprecedented new build orders of 37 ships at a cost of US dollars 1.5 billion in his five years tenure as director, which uh, resulted in an all time record for which he was awarded the Business Leader of the Year 2020, uh, 2010 award. 
He ensured that the fleet being ordered serves SCI well for the next two, two decades and meeting the highest standards, new regulations of IMO, and ensuring SEI remains competitive in the world of shipping. Consequent to his superannuation from SEI in 2010, Umesh Grover has held several key positions in maritime, logistics, and port sector. He was associated with Pipav Shipyard as head of international uh, marketing uh, and uh, made efforts to tie up with large reputed Korean shipbuilders for jointly constructing ships in India. He served as CEO, CEO INSA, was a trustee on board of JNPT, and was chairman of Narota Morarji Institute of Shipping for eight years. Presently, uh, Umesh uh, Grover is the Secretary General of Container Freight Stations Association of India, CFSAI. In addition, he is also a policy and strategy advisor with all cargo logistics and current job terminals and logistics, a shallow drafted port adjacent to JNPA. So this is all about, uh, we have uh, uh, about our chief guest. Then the next, I would like to introduce the speaker for today. So the speaker for today's session uh, is Dr. Joshin John is currently working as an associate professor and dean research at Xavier Institute of Management and Entrepreneurship, known as XIME Cochin. He is a graduate mechanical engineer from College of Engineering, Trivandrum, University of Kerala, holds a doctorate in management from IIM Lucknow. Prior to joining academics, he worked in capacities of design engineer, engineering manager and consultant for shipbuilding, repair and offshore oil and gas industries for leading conglomerates. His current research interests include sustainability, green operations, humanitarian logistics and disaster. Disaster management for water-based disasters such as cyclones and floods. He is associated with several professional bodies, including Production and Operations Management Society of USA, Society of Operations Management India, Deci Decision Sciences Institute USA, North American Case Research Association, NACRA, and Institute of Marine Engineers India. He has published research articles in several scientific journals indexed in Web of Science, Scopus, and ABDC quality list, and has authored case studies that are distributed by renowned publishers such as IB Publishing, uh, Case Center UK, and Harvard Business Publishing. For his work in 2018, North American Case Research Association awarded him with the prestigious Paul Lawrence Fellowship being one among 10 global awardees. In 2019, Association of Indian Management Schools, AIMS, conferred on, conferred on him AIMS Ramaswamy P. Iyer Best Young Teacher Award. He also won the Best Case Award instituted by AIMS in the same year for his field research case on disaster response operations. So we are extremely glad to have these uh, two distinguished people with us today. Now let us have an enlightening session by Dr. Joshin John, who is going to give us deep insights into integrated development of port and maritime infrastructure, shipbuilding and repair capabilities, a critical review and benchmarking of national maritime vision, policies and its trickle down effects. So uh, I welcome you, Dr. Joshin John, and over to you. Thank you, Dr. Shija, for that generous introduction. Um, share the slides. All right, uh, I just wanted to uh, to ask whether you were able to see the screen before I start. Yeah, yeah we are able to yes, see the yes, screen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I, I would uh, want to make this a very interactive session um, because this is a, uh, first I would like to thank uh, the Institute of Naval Architects for giving me this opportunity. 
um, I have been associated with um, shipbuilding um, and also in offshore sector. And then I moved on to research, uh, but I have been closely monitoring uh, what has been going around in different parts of the world. And in this presentation, I would like to, uh, to present some of the observations in terms of the integrated development of port maritime infrastructure, uh, shipbuilding and repair capabilities. Uh, you already know that there is a logistics policy, there is a, a national logistics policy, there is the Gati Shakti program, and there is also the Maritime India Vision 2030. I would also take that thread and review it and benchmark it with what's going around the world and its manifestation in terms of business impact uh, and what happens at the ground level. So uh, before we start, I would like to just touch base with the, with the, the audience. Uh, can you please put on the chat box if you're there from where you are listening from? Just put a hi on the chat box. All right. I have one from Pune, Mumbai. All right, because we have uh, different parts of the story to connect and I will be connecting developments across different ports and um, um, yard location. So I would also request you to chip in uh, from your side. I know some of you are on uh, YouTube, so maybe there may be a difficulty, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, this would be an interactive session from time to time. So let's move on. The layout of the presentation. In this session, we are going to discuss uh, starting with logistics in India. Uh, what are what is the state of affairs and some reduced increases the logistics in india is not exactly as seen in many parts in developing as well as developed world there are some peculiar peculiarities i had also done some work on multimodal transportation so i will also bring that into the presentation we will touch upon port infrastructure development uh, in particular the sagarmala or the ocean necklace we call it we will connect the dots. We will connect between the major uh, ocean transport, intermodal transport, where we connect with the rail and the road transport, waterways, uh, the hinterland connects to the ports. We will further talk on shipbuilding as a pivot. This was something um, that came up when I was discussing with Mr. Daskuta on, uh, on the capacities of um, the shipyards that we have, its capabilities, and whether it can pivot uh, as a point in our logistics agenda, logistics as well as the Maritime India Ocean agenda. I will talk further on policies uh, as an enabler or a barrier. Uh, I will discuss a little bit about the investor's uh, standpoint and the, the business environment that goes along with it. Finally, we will uh, reflect on the trajectory of the de developments and conclude with some um, aspirational remarks. So first, on the logistics, if you look at uh, this graph, uh, you will see that on the y-axis of this graph, you will see the logistics cost as a percentage of GDP. And on the x-axis of this graph, you will find the GDP per, per capita. Uh, so you know that uh, in India, the GDP per capita is just around um, $2,200. Um, and um, you can see um, commensurate um, GDP per capita for other countries in the developed world. Um, this graph is slightly dated, but you will also observe that China right now has a, a GDP per capita of about uh, 12,000 USD per person. And one of the things that you will notice is that in most of the developed countries, the um, logistics cost as a percentage of GDP is actually 
in a single digit, it, it's pretty low. You will usually find that in ECD or EU economies, this is about six to eight percent. But in the developing countries, this is very high. Sometimes it's, it's in two, two digits. Uh, for India, it's about 14 percent. Now, uh, you may find some uh, transient effects if you look at the recent data because of the COVID and the associated supply chain crunch. But over a long period of time, this is usually the trend that we find. And as the country gets developed and as it invests more into logistics, um, the logistics cost comes down. Um, this is very important because if the logistics cost is high, there is a high burden on growth. I think we all get to know that every time there is a, a fuel price rise and it, it directly affects the inflation. So uh, we are very much aware about the effects of logistics as a cost to business. Now we will move on to um, symptoms of uh, a higher cost of logistics. So if you look at the, the index of the, log the logistics performance index, you will find that India's LPI is somewhere around 44. Um, and you see that there are several symptoms when you look at the logistics system uh, as a cost to business. And one of the areas we lack uh, is the infrastructure, inadequacy in infrastructure. And if you look at the, the different components of LPI, you would see that the infrastructure component is relatively low. This would result in um, a cost because of low speed, you won't be able to travel faster. You will find that there are congested networks, whether it is highways or waterways or roadways. Um, you will find choke points. So you can also relate it to what you would see in a queuing theory, right? There are queuing systems around the world in different places, whether it's a, a retail outlet or in a hospital or, in a, or on the way to the airport, right? You can see a lot of queues, but in the traffic system also, if you have too many queues and there is a higher turnaround time, that is a indication that there is an inbuilt logistics cost. You will also see that there are deficiencies in digital infrastructure. So we have a concept called supply chain visibility where we will be able to track and monitor uh, different um, flow of materials, um, flow of information, for flow of people. Uh, if we don't have a good supply chain visibility, that also leads to a cost of logistics. For instance, if you are in the, the free grid business, and if you are not able to track where are your uh, boxes uh, and how can you connect it with um, the ongoing demand this service a spot market where you want to pick a cargo, if you don't have this real-time visibility, there's a cost to business. Uh, and over the years, you can see that many shipping companies have tried to build that capability to improve their performance. Uh, higher turnaround times, cost of waiting transport. It also means that your fleet utilization is low because your, your vessels are supposed to be moving, not waiting in ports. So you can see that there is uh, the cost of ships waiting at an outrank rate for berthing. Uh, there are, you can see trains traveling uh, in, in uh, waiting in limited track sections. You can see trucks waiting in, in transfer point or checkpoints, but I think on the on the road side it has reduced quite a bit recently especially with the fast tags and um unlocking these bottlenecks um and i was trying to to take a bird's eye view from the top um looking at uh, different ports on how the traffic is move is is moved and um i hope some of you would recognize this port can somebody put on the chat uh, which which port is this Can you recognize this port? That's right. So you can see this is the port of Singapore. And if you if you notice um, this uh, location and the movement, you can see pretty much SS. You know, if you if you look for some time, how is the movement and what is the turnaround time? And there are there are a lot of uh, sensors or, or technology that you can use to understand this. Um, similarly, this is no, a no-brainer. You can see the port of Mumbai. Uh, you can see uh, there is a certain 
um, berthing uh, facility, and but you also see that sometimes ships are waiting, um, which has to reduce, and it also needs to to match um, global benchmarks. You can see in MIV that there are certain ambitions in that direction, but um, we have to really check on the ground how much of that is achieved. Uh, moving again further on to symptoms and effects. Um, one of the effects that you see is that there's a lost business. When you have a high logistics cost, you will also have lost business to competing entities. 10 years ago, I had an opportunity to talk to uh, the, the chairman of the Colombo dockyard. And uh, on that discussion, we found that a lot of transshipment for India is done at Colombo. And if you look at this uh, picture, which I just took a couple of days ago, you can see that in this in the strait that is from Suez to Malacca or from the Persian Gulf, you can see that the ships are moving and it probably gets uh, near the Cochin port, but largely it gets uh, docked in this region, right? And um, which means that we are missing out on a huge transshipment opportunity here um, that um, is in, in, in the order of a few million dollars. Um, I also want to discuss with you the developments on ports. So one of my students was interning in the Gangavaram Fortress, and I want to take a case in point. Uh, there are berths that are added, but sometimes we see that uh, the system is sort of designed for demolish, uh, where you can see that it is not because of lack of port facilities that the ships are waiting. It's because the cargo, which is unloaded, cannot be moved to the hinterlands and it's waiting for uh, to be picked up by a single uh, train line that has to pick up all this cargo. So you can see that the bottlenecks are not necessarily at one point, it is spread in different parts of the ecosystem. Um, I would uh, now draw down also on the importance of waterways. So you can see on this picture on the right, uh, the port of Antwerp, where there is a lot of movement in waterways. Uh, this is on, on the river front and it goes into the hinterland to Germany. Uh, now on the picture on the bottom right, this is the, the Bay of Shanghai and you can see that the movement of inland vessels into central China is pretty high. This is one of the areas where you have a high savings because the waterway transport is actually one of the cheapest in the world. And I think we are not using it up to potential. Recently, you may have seen in the news that um, there has been a river cruise on Ganga, um, one of the largest cruises apparently in the world. But I think uh, how much of our waterways are actually used uh, for freight movement is a question that we need to look at. And we, I, we come to that point now. If you look at the different transport modes, uh, its cost structure and its usage, we will see that in, in India, the Indian rupee per metric ton kilometer, it's highest for uh, air, which is around 80. Uh, it is 3.6 for um, road. It's about two for uh, water which is actually a little bit surprising because usually that's the lowest. And um, what I find is it's probably because we have not reached scale as it, it has in other parts of the world. A pipeline is two and then um, for rail, it is 1.6. If you compare the major economic blocks or countries, you will see that the percentage of um, share of freight movement is extremely high uh, in the major blocks by, by waterways. You can see it's around 8% in the United States. It's about 8.7% in China and 7% uh, in the European Union. For India, the share of free movement in waterways is just about 0.5%. It is slightly up now. Some, some statistics show that it is about 2%, uh, but it's still uh, comparatively pretty low. Now, uh, we come to Sagarmala, which is the idea of port development. I think this has uh, generated a lot of excitement. 
And uh, if we look at the crux of it, there is a lot of modernization and upgrading of the, uh, the existing infrastructure inputs. We see that the cargo handling facility is almost going to double um, from about 13,000 million tons per annum to 2,600. Um, by 2030, which is pretty good, you will also see that there is a lot of connect. There is the road uh, transport, which is the golden quadrilateral that is um, connecting these um, major hubs. There are also rail lines that connect across uh, different cities um, and ports. So that, that is a good development. But when you look at the coastal transport, uh, right now, that improvement in coastal transport is a very logical outcome as the, uh, from the Sagarmala project. When we look at Sagarmala project, if you have more ports and if you have more movement of di different types of goods from coal to steel to container along the, um, along the coastal ways and also the inland waterways, which is picked up either domestically or from the international trade route, the logical outcome is that we should have a higher maritime traffic. Uh, we see that in 2020, in India, the shipbuilding was about 30,000 GT. And in the Maritime India Vision, we have a target of about uh, 500,000 GT, which is quite phenomenal. And we also want to move up from a world rank in shipbuilding, which is more than um, rank number 20, to the top 10. And as we had come to a topic for this presentation, I was talking to uh, the president, Mr. Jyotishman Das, and discussing how shipbuilding can be a pivot to mass maritime prosperity, whether that is actually possible. Um, given the Maritime India vision, the national logistics policy, and Gati Shakti, I have gone through all these documents and I'm sure that many of you have gone through that. And we see that in, in letter, it is pretty good, but we also want to check whether it is good in spirit and on the ground. We find that there is an investment of 20,000 crores I, I think it's in chapter six on improving uh, shipbuilding uh, capabilities and facilities. So I wanted to uh, further dwell on that um, on the advice of uh, the president, uh, Mr. Dasgupta. Uh, my observation, so I had done a lot of field research on what the top performing yards in the world are doing and also study the practices of yards in India. And uh, I have, um, in this presentation, classified it into three levels. One is, what do we see at a country level? Two, what do we see at the ecosystem level? And three, what do we see at a shipyard level? So I will dwell a little bit on these three areas. I will also share my full paper. Uh, it seems that uh, there is some interest on the details of this, so I will share uh, this paper also with you uh, in the chat in some time. At the country level, what I found is that among all the major maritime nations and shipbuilding nations, I would call it the Asian Tiger plus plus, because if you look at the Asian Tigers, it's Singapore and Taiwan and Korea. Uh, um, but plus plus what I'm trying to indicate there's Japan and also there is China. There is a high degree of correlation between shipbuilding and industrialization of that country. If you look at it from the trajectory after the World War II, most of the countries who did very good in as an industrial nation with the high manufacturing output were very good in shipbuilding also. Um, so that is something that we should be looking at because our manufacturing base is actually pretty low. Um, there are some arguments from several quarters. For instance, you know, recently uh, our early RBI governor had commented that uh, we should probably focus more on services because manufacturing is at the cost of sustainability. 
Um, yes, there are different reasons from different quarters of the world, but um, we are relatively a very low emitter at the on a per capita level. And if you look at um, sustainability with the understanding of common but differentiated responsibilities of moving towards sustainability, I don't think we have emitted much and it need not be at the cost of development. So we still have a scope uh, for uh, pivoting towards industrialization and, and it is important to have a base, at least about 30% or 40% um, to, to contribute to the economy from manufacturing as a sector. We also see that in many of these countries, shipbuilding is looked at as a strategic industry, strategic industry uh, with a long-term vision. When I'm talking about long-term, it is 20 years plus. The, the vision is, um, is long-term. It does not change with uh, um, change in the government or the politics. Um, so we see that that is something that we can observe if you look at Japan or in South Korea, where there is a top level intervention in developing shipbuilding as a national asset. And there are benefits to that, not only in the shipbuilding industry, but also in the industrial ancillary um, complex. We see that um, in countries where there is a big shipbuilding industry, there are largely protectionist regimes. And basically, when I'm talking about protect, protectionist regimes, we see that there are uh, clusters or gravity centers, uh, which, which is basically attracting a lot of uh, shipping liners to build it in their yards, A, because of their cost advantage and because of their um, high um, turnaround time, low time for production, um, and also a very favorable, favorable tax structure. I have uh, not, I'm not going to dwell too much on the ta tax structure, but uh, you sometimes see that when there is an Indian shipyard and it has to, uh, to import uh, materials uh, for outfit for, or other components, um, and that is given a tax waiver, basically you are in incentivizing um, the ancillary ecosystem in a different part of the world, uh, which means that your local ancillary ecosystem also has to compete with um, all that imports, which does not have a levy. So I think uh, there is quite a bit to that. Please go through this paper, which I will be sharing with you on the chat link. Let me just pick that up. Okay, I, I, I will share that and yeah. I've shared a file. Uh, if you want to go into some of those details, you can uh, pick that up from the chat window. You will also see there are some peculiar characteristics at an ecosystem level. When you look at an ecosystem, um, let's say the ecosystem in South Korea, um, the east southern part where there is the shore from Pohang to Ulsan, you see that there is a lot of partnership between different entities. Um, HHI, Hyundai Heavy Industries, for instance, has a partnership with Pohang. There is a lot of cross-holding, which means that their fates are intertwined. If you do well, I also do well, which means there is a common alignment between different yards. You also see that there are um, partnerships with OEM and they are going to have centers near your yards. That means your uh, supply chain is better streamlined. You have reduced bottlenecks, um, which moves to the concept of um, self-sufficiency or what we call here in India as Atmanirpur. Uh, it is uh, quite surprising that for many of our uh, shipbuilding yards, we are dependent on equipment from abroad, be it for um, machinery or uh, 
engines or even some outfit components. Uh, I would also want to make a small reference to, to our, our other um, allied modes, for instance, road or rail or for uh, air or space cargo. You can find that um, there has been a lot of development, research and development to make indigenous equipments. Uh, for instance, engine manufacturing, uh, you can see that Mahindra has done that. You can see that Tata has done that. There may be technology transfers, but largely you have reduced the supply chain dependencies to quite a bit. This, uh, if you if you stretch to the other end on high tech industries, uh, ISRO is a, is, a, is a big player in the world stage. And you can see that uh, they now have capabilities for cryo three uh, engines. Uh, shipbuilding is not necessarily always uh, rocket science, but it seems to be that we are finding it more difficult than the space, space industry to be self-reliant. I think there is uh, these advantages that many, many countries have at an ecosystem level on being self-reliant. On shipyards, we find that the shipyards are positioned. So, uh, what I mean by position, positioning shipyards is that they don't try to do everything. Uh, there is some literature in the Harvard Business Review by uh, a professor known as Wickham Skinner, where he talks about focused factories. Focused factories that are, are, are uh, businesses that have a certain portfolio. So, for instance, if you have a hospital uh, that makes, that does only hernia surgeries. And it's just does some surgeries, and it gets so well at doing that specialized uh, surgery that uh, it becomes an expert in that product, and it becomes very difficult for for other hospitals to compete. You can see such sort of factories in some of these yards, and at the, at the level of scale that they have, it would be very difficult for other or other um, competitors to compete. Sometimes you see something called a PWP. PWP is plant within a plant. When you have a plant within a plant, you may have not only one product. This is for, let's say, a medium-sized yard, which probably does not have that scale, where they still have two or three products, and it, it is a good fit for the processes in the yard. Um, sometimes we see that um, the yards in India try to do different things based on whatever demand is available. Uh, it sometimes looks like a knee-jerk reaction, but it uh, affects uh, the entire production process. Um, and it also uh, affects the supply chain. Uh, so I think that's something that we need to consider at an ecosystem level. Um, on logistics, you can also see that when there are ecosystems, the JIT is possible, which is just in time. It helps you save on inventory. Uh, because the ancillary uh, ecosystem is very much um, closely around your production units. You can see this in the Chennai area, in Nungampakam, if you look at the automobile industry, where the production units are surrounded by a lot of ancillary industry, and you can see that there's an industrial cluster that goes around, uh, grows around it. Uh, you can also see this in many of the yards in East Asia, where uh, the shipyard is basically an assembling factory, right? And that is actually really possible with the, with uh, ancillary ecosystem that do grows around it, uh, which will also mean that you have reduced logistics cost um, and better connect to critical machinery and equipment. Um, at a shipyard level, sometimes the productivity is not productivity loss is not necessarily because of the the tonnage, the the erection um, speed which is how much of how much of tonnage of plot that you can erect in a certain time. But it is also because of waiting for certain critical components. And without that, you may not be able to pre-outfit, you may not, you may have to delay your launch and et cetera, et cetera. So it's very important to create that ecosystem uh, for you to be very competitive. This is one of the observations I have seen. Uh, at the shipyard level, we see that uh, there is a lot of integration between design, planning, production, and scheduling. This is this is um, not so much in the yards that we see here. For instance, uh, the design unit has a certain time to respond to a production issue. Um, there is um, 
larger disconnect between different departments, which is design, uh, procurement, uh, planning, and production. So I think that um, lack of connect also creates um, issues in delays. Uh, it also means that we may have to look at how, what is your production technology? Are you going to look at uh, assembly unit where you have IHOP technology, which is integrated hull, outfit, and painting? How many of our yards are able to use uh, um, IHOP technology? Uh, where you can basically make sure that there is a design and you can cut it into different blocks. Uh, you can outsource the production to different uh, subcontractors. And suppose you are outsourcing it in, in uh, winter, um, the blocks will, will come to the yard for assembly, let's say in summer, and get alive, even taking a account the thermal expansion because of the of the change in temperature so um, for the shipyard to work as assembly unit uh, there are certain production systems to be in place for which there needs to be some scale these are some of the issues that we find here um, as i mentioned before you don't uh, you also see that the yards don't play with their portfolio too much some yards are small uh, so they focus on variety. They are not in the volume game. Some yards are made to stock. Lastly, it's like a continuous flow manufacturing. It's not exactly a flow manufacturing, but it's akin to that where you have a scale, a scale possible because you're trying to produce the same kind of ship in a very large quantity. So these are some of the advantages that I see at the shipyard level. Um, the, uh, this also means that in BTO, you are process oriented. Uh, in MTS, you are product oriented. So um, that IHOP implementation also helps uh, you to launch faster because the outfitting of the components in the blocks is not necessarily done after the launch. Sometimes I've seen that 80 to 90 percent of the, the outfit components are uh, pre-fitted. So, so after the launch, you don't have too much of work. This is because the yard also invests quite a bit on the subcontractors. And uh, that enables that um, the yard can even closely monitor the developments uh, at the subcontractor level and check whether that is in line with their production schedule. So I think you can find some of these details in the um, in the Chat window, yes, I have some questions in the chat window. Yes, uh, you can uh, get this on a mail. That's that's fine with me. Um, next slide is actually on an assessment of major shipyards in India. So I just was I was going through some of this uh, data uh, in in the paper. Uh, this that was the data in 2011. It's slightly dated, but I tried to get a little bit more recent data yesterday. And uh, this is the this is what I find. I have listed some of the major shipyards in India. We can see that the Kuchin shipyard is up there on the top, and there we have uh, um, Hindustan shipyard in Vishakhapatnam, Masgandok, Garden Reach, Goa shipyard. Um, I only selected uh, some of them. I'm sure there are more. Uh, in the private sector, we have Pipa, which is now Reliance Naval, ABG, Bharti, Chokli. Uh, we have selected some of these yards. I'm now trying to compare with the maritime India vision, right? We have a certain ambition of um, 500,000 GT by 2030. And uh, we have uh, the order book of 62 yards for CSL, 10 for HSL, 14 for MDL. Uh, you can see that uh, CSL is actually doing pretty well. When I was an engineering student in 2006, uh, you know, I, I, I had the opportunity of meeting Mr. Madhu uh, when he was the GM of business development and uh, very enthusiastic and getting many orders. But we can now see that CSL is getting making forays, um, trying to turn around different other uh, talks, for instance, at Hooghly or setting up one in Andamans or in other locations. 
So we can see that some of the yards which are doing well can contribute towards developing other yards which are not so doing well. And you can see that the element of partnership that I tried to, to mention um, in this last slide is, is developing slowly. I think that is important because in some areas you would compete, but in some other areas you should cooperate. And you can see this even in uh, in one of some of the best performing yards in East Asia. Um, now, in terms of uh, in terms of development, uh, the investment is twenty thousand crores. Uh, twenty thousand crores uh, is a capital outlay. Um, and I try to make sense of that figure. It is quite a bit, uh, but then I realized that that's just about fifteen percent of the railway budget, right? Uh, if that's the amount the government is going to put as an investment, and we also need to see private investment. And when we're looking at private investor, I was trying to, to look at uh, some of the figures on how an investor would look at, look at it. For the years we have here, we will look at operating metrics. Uh, we will look at all this stuff. We will also look at dock utilization, what is inventory turns, um, hardcore operating metrics. But we will also look at these metrics because if you're looking at investor, you know, he may be a businessman and he will also look at returns or he or she will look at returns. Um, we can see that some of the yards have uh, decent margins, uh, but you should also make it attractive for um, third party, such as a private investor to invest in shipbuilding business. Uh, for that reason, we may have to compare whether it's a level playing field, with service uh, competitiveness in yards in India, versus elsewhere in the world. And also for an investor to invest in the sector of shipbuilding, right? This is an important point I will drive again towards uh, in, in, in the end of the presentation. Uh, I also want to, to um, pick on the points that private investors have um, made investments. For instance, if we have Pipawa, Pipawa was actually supposed to be the largest uh, uh, dry dock, largest dock in the world, four four hundred thousand. Um, but I think something went wrong. We need to look at the reasons on what happened and also learn from the lessons. Not that doesn't happen again. Um, let's move towards uh, a concept called line of balance. A line of balance is something that we want to check when we do production planning and control. Uh, but at a broad level, I'm trying to look at, for our ambition in MIV 2030, what is the capital outlay that we are looking at? Is that enough for our ambition uh, as an investment from the uh, from private as well as public sector? Are we looking at a scale of production that is viable, right? So on this right side, you can see that, um, there are different um, cost uh, metrics. So if you look at India, the for 100 percent of the material that you buy, you get it at 87 percent, 89 percent from other countries. If you look at uh, the labor um, cost component, you can see that it is about half in other places, and there is also the financing cost, which makes it uh, 30 percent cheaper. Right. So uh, why is that possible? There are multiple. Why is that? Um, so there are multiple reasons. Uh, you see that uh, sometimes we have not achieved the threshold level to reach that level of competitiveness and competitiveness. And is it actually possible to uh, to achieve that level of threshold without a strategic investment in shipbuilding? Right. These are some questions that has to be looked at the policy level. Uh, what are we doing to develop an ancillary ecosystem, which means that uh, yard yeah, should not be waiting for um, an outfit component or an engine to come from Europe um, to meet its production line, right? Are we reducing our supply chain dependencies? Um, are we using our capabilities in technical institutes, such as um, IIT Kharagpur or IIT Madras, or the or NSTL or a lot of other technical institutes to to develop engines. I think uh, uh, development of um, 
local suppliers which can uh, provide self sufficiency and reduce supply chain dependencies are uh, not only important from a lead time standpoint but it is also important from the standpoint of being self sufficient um, because when there is a demand then your priorities can otherwise change uh, production technologies i usually i have largely referred to this in my paper so i think i am not going to repeat it now um, from a policy level are there are we creating enabling conditions will you find a private investor that's going to invest in shipyard along with government investment which is uh, required uh, without say uh, are there is there a coordination between different shipbuilding clusters on the east coast and the west coast on positioning shipyards and the different types of vessels that uh, they are going to produce now there is going to be a need there is a market if you have a, a, a sagarmala project and if you have increased maritime transport if you send to new iwt uh, driven um, traffic there is going to be a demand but give for that demand are we creating an enabling condition for the private sector to participate uh, which needs a lot of strategic coordination between different uh, players uh, this is something we still have to look at um i am going to get a little bit technical not too much but relooking at the line of balance uh, from a ppp standpoint uh, a line of balance is something that we look at when we have a project and when we have a production schedule whether all the components that needs to be there coming out of different lines are arriving in time or there are gaps and deficiencies that needs to be filled if there are gaps and deficiencies we will be out of balance our uh, schedule will go for a toss uh, i am putting up uh, the classical uh, ppp um, hierarchical planning figure where there is a, a strategic level where you can kind of demand forecast or estimate what is the demand that is going to have uh, and you can um, prepare a, a long term plan and at the shipyard level now this can be done at two levels one is at an ecosystem level let's say all the demand uh, that is going to be created in the country but also at in local clusters you can also look at a, a production planning and control at the shipyard level what is the number of ships in this yard so you can do this at different units of analysis but in a yard level you have to check what is the dock capacity that you have um do you have enough capacity for shop machinery uh, do you have enough subcontractors that are skilled for a certain uh, mode of production uh, what is the workforce available uh, if you have subcontractors uh, uh, will they be able to meet your production schedule what are your supply chain dependencies hull steel i think this can be met to some extent but if you are looking at equipment and outfitting are there supply chain dependencies which will keep get you out of balance um finally at a, at the shop floor level scheduling uh, are you using the traditional methods or are you using optimization techniques so uh, if you look at the present age you are having machine learning algorithm so if you have a lot of um data on previous ships that are built and if you looking at its nesting and the waste stage uh, some of these optimization techniques can actually predict uh the problems that you will have and the problems that uh, you should foresee and uh, come to terms with so yesterday i was talking to somebody who was in an erp development uh, firm um what they were trying to use is in an erp development they had they have different phases uh, of implementation they are using machine learning algorithms studying past implementations to predict where will be the problems that they will face in the current and future implementation a lot of this can actually bring in uh, efficiencies to the yard um but i think we still have to look at most structural issues but this is something that uh, the the advanced yards are already doing um i had told about the level of integration between the design the planning fabrication and the production and some of the advanced yards i i think um uh, use of analytics on 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 shop floor level can also be very useful um please note that two levels of analysis shipyard level as business firms they will always look at shipyard level 
but you should also have somebody to look at it from the ecosystem level. When I'm talking about ecosystem level, there should be people at, uh, from the government, from different stakeholders in the industry to, to see whether things are going or you have to raise red flags when it's not going. I think these are some of the, the, the base practices necessary for a strategic business like for a strategic industry like this to take off. If it does not go, uh, you will uh, miss the boat as we have always missed. So I think it's some a lesson we have to learn um, at this juncture. Uh, this is uh, again on positioning. Uh, this is the quadrant on the left top where you have low volume, high variety. This is the built to order vessels. And on this side, we have high volume and low variety vessels. So I, I just put some stars. Um, can I see on the chat box, uh, where do you think your shipyard or the, the unit that you are associated with will fall? It's on the left top, in the center, or on the right bottom? Anybody want to take that up? If you have a shipyard, are you having a built to order shipyard where you have a high variety, but very low volume? Or are you having a moderate variety, but a, a, a moderate volume, which means you have different types of ships, uh, but not too many types of ships. But here you have, you are focused on only certain types of ships. Left bottom. Okay, left top. Okay, so I, I think we are, uh, we are clear on the fact that we are on the left side, right? And uh, it's also important to know that if we are on the left top, there is a fit, it's a line of fit. But if we are away from this, we will have problems. So if you look at another industry, uh, like computer industry, uh, Dell, Dell computers were on this area and that's called mass customization, where you have possibilities for a high variety and extremely high volume. Uh, very few industries are able to do that. And if we are not having those processes in place, and if we are um, um, out of the line of fit, we can foresee problems. So in terms of positioning, this is something that we need to look at. I see a question from Mr. Daskutta on the slide number 10. I will just move back to the slide number 10. Um, Table on slide number 10, yes. So this is basically um, a table that would explain what are the different components of cost. On here, we see there is material cost. Here, we see labor cost. And here, we see financing cost. Uh, the material cost is about 60 to 70%. Labor cost is around 30 to 40%. We see that uh, the material cost on an average is... Um, about 10% less uh, than um, competing uh, nations such as China, Korea, or Japan. And for the labor component, uh, you see that it is extremely low. It is about 50%. Um, now, if you look at shipbuilding as an industry, shipbuilding industry can be uh, cap capital intensive, right? You can actually look at the, at the labor uh, capital mix but given that we have uh, uh, high workforce available, uh, we have to look at uh, improving productivity. And this lack of productivity, when we look at uh, on, a, on a shipbuilding uh, production scale, may not be necessarily only because of uh, the shop floor labor productivity, but it is also because of supply chain dependencies, which means that a certain workstation cannot proceed unless um, the required um, work in progress or raw materials are available. So in, so there are both sides. One is uh, productivity at a, a shop floor level, but it's also the productivity loss because of supply chain issues. Uh, we also see uh, that uh, from the tax standpoint, the, the financing cost is extremely high uh, for um, these Asian countries, it's one to five percent, one to two percent on an average, but it's about ten to twelve percent uh, in India. Uh, this is the shipbuilding universe. Uh, when I was doing my field survey, 
Korea was about 42% at that point of time, it was the largest. Uh, but now you can see that uh, China is uh, picked up 44%, leaving Korea 33%. Um, now, followed by Japan and India. We can see uh, onto the next slide. This is something I want to uh, touch upon if you are looking at uh, shipbuilding. Um, and I try to check on the mandate. Uh, do we have a mandate on production? Um, which means that uh, are, we have, are we having a, a top-down ambition that we're going to have 500,000 tons? Um, one of the things I see, uh, and I tried to check who has this mandate, and I found that uh, we have had several changes in the ministry. You know, it was the Ministry of Surface, Surface Transport earlier, then it became the Ministry of Shipping, and it becomes Ministry of Port, uh, uh, Shipping, and Waterways. Uh, but largely, the mandate, I, I find it here, it is to develop globally competitive shipbuilding and repair facilities, right? Now, I also tried to check on this, um, that do we have uh, really uh, space for that? Because if you look at the, the entities uh, in the in the MPSW, we will find that LIDIS largely has an objective on statutory compliances, smart code, safety of shipping, so last. Um, so sometimes in in the structuring of an organization, are we missing um, important things? Uh, if you if you Compare other countries, for instance, uh, Japan or South Korea, there has been uh, organizations that drive uh, capacity building. And we can see that also in uh, India. We can see that if you look at uh, the NHAI, which is uh, the organization responsible for developing roads, and you know that Nitin Gadkari keeps telling from time to time that we built 50 kilometers of roads in a day, 60 kilometers of roads in a day, or for the airport authority of India. Um, and I think when there is that kind of accountability, um, there is also an out outcome. And uh, then I also try to look at who are the people uh, in terms of proficiency who has to drive this. And if you're looking at shipbuilding, it should be largely naval architects. Um, um, and um, so I, I think there should be a body, for instance, um, the Shipbuilding Authority of India or, or something equivalent, uh, where you have a certain onus to drive shipbuilding capacity and not only drive shipbuilding capacity, but to create uh, an ecosystem that enables shipbuilding. Um, and that has not only happened in other parts of the world, but also on your sister modes on road and rail, you can see that from this figure that we are going to be one of the largest um, markets for cars in the world. Uh, we are about uh, the third now. Um, on the rail network, we have a robust rail network. We are the fourth largest in the world. Uh, we also are among the elite um, um, space launch vehicles. If you look at ISRO, you may have seen that they have got 134 satellites in a single launch. And in terms of commercial competitiveness, they are extremely competitive. And this is when they have a lot of supply chain dependencies, including having to get a cryogenic third stage engine. Uh, for shipbuilding, we are less than 1%. I think there is something that should be done. Um, I think probably INA should take the lead in making this representation. Probably it's something that fell into a crack, but falling into the crack has a lot of consequences. Um, now, finally, when we move towards uh, the last slide, which is uh, a conclusion and some aspirational remarks, uh, we see that it's almost 75 years since independence, and we say that we're getting into what is called the Amrit Kal, which is from the 75 to 100 years. Um, and now we also see that there's a green transition, that there is a, a reduction of um, emissions, GHG emissions that is driven by uh, the international community, which means that there is also going to be production of um, alternative vehicles, especially for coastal short distance transport, uh, inland waterways, or for coastal transport, uh, which means that there is an opportunity. Um, I know there are a lot of players. Uh, I have talked to Mr. Sundit, who has now and I think that has done a lot of good work. 
um, and I think the Cochin water, water Metro is also being considered as a good model. Uh, but having said that, uh, I think the focus should largely be uh, on the shipbuilding capacity capability and in, in increase the, the, the maritime leg of the multimodal segment. Um, I think we should also drive some, uh, uh, get some inspiration from the ancestors who were pretty good in shipbuilding and also in, in, in fleets uh, where you have the Samudraputtas, Mauryas and Cholas have a great shipbuilding heritage and having their influence far east, right? Now there is also uh, the concern on what is our presence in the Indian Ocean, which is probably the only country which has an ocean named after it, but what is the shipbuilding capability? Uh, I would on a lighter note borrow something from popular fiction that we should have a compass, uh, a compass that is like uh, Jack Sparrow's compass, right? Which will point to what you want and not necessarily what, uh, not necessarily that points towards the north, which by which I mean London or the IMO office, because uh, you can see that countries who have, uh, have their own vision and their own strategy um, and not necessarily influenced by um, forums where you may not have a larger representation um, has not necessarily served you well. With that, I would uh, conclude my presentation. Uh, I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joshin, for your wonderful presentation. I hope we can take the questions towards the end after the uh, uh, chief guest uh, address for today. Will that be all right? Sure. Uh, so we'll uh, move on to the address by the chief guest. And I welcome uh, the honorable chief guest of the day, Mr. Umesh Grover, for his valuable address to us. Over to you, Mr. Umesh Grover. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shrija, for uh, allowing me to speak now. I think we had one of the brilliant presentations by Dr. Joshin John, uh, bubbling with knowledge and uh, very passionate about the subject. It took me back to my journey, which started, of course, way back in 1967 when I joined the MET and 71 when I started sailing. And I went to the first shipyard to take a delivery of a vessel way back in August 1973 at Vaidak shipyard. Uh, journey after that has been long and I had the pleasure of being a part of the shipping industry as well as to some extent a part of the shipbuilding. Being the director technical of shipping operation of India, my responsibility included purchase of ships, identifying the shipyards globally, defining the standards, working closely with IRS and other classification societies, and decide on design as well as a shipyard. Obviously, the preference would have been being a nationalistic approach, having served SCI for 39 years. My dedication was to the nation and do best for the Indian shipyards and let the first opportunity be the Indian shipyards. But it didn't work. Really, it did not work. And I will share some of my experiences. I will not repeat what Dr. John, uh, Joshin John has mentioned in his speech. He covered beautifully the logistics cost, the LPI, which you mentioned we are on 44, logistics, that's a World Bank Index. Just for information, in 2016, we were at 144. And we have improved in four years to 44, which is a big credit. And one of the measurement is also the development of infrastructure. It is happening, but at a fairly slower pace. You touched upon the roads. And yes, some 30,000 kilometers road connectivity from um, east to west, north, south. Uh, it's something phenomenal. The GST bringing in abolition of uh, that uh, excise tax, that's uh, you know reduce the burden, uh, a long stay on the roads, better vehicles, 
better roads, what an average Indian trucker used to do 200 kilometers a day. Now they're doing up to 300, 350, where the US and the Europe average is 700 kilometers a day. So we are still far behind. Waterways um, is where the thrust has been from the government, but nothing really has moved in the last couple of years because uh, barring in the last two, three years, but not at the pace at what it should have been. Uh, let's come back to why the shipping or shipbuilding has not been a uh, sort of a, not gone well with the Indian infrastructure or Indian building. You mentioned about ISRO and the rockets. Shipping is not a rocket science, but I think we find it easier to build the rockets, but difficult to build the ships. And let us look at some of the reasons. Uh, number one, when I became, when my interaction for ordering the ships started, we obviously invited from the Indian yards as well as from the foreign yards. Let me give you an example. We placed order for two container ships with Hyundai way back in 2006 on the 14th of November. And the day we signed the contract, we were told these are 4,500 TUs. We were told one vessel will be delivered, delivered on 22nd October 2008, the second one on 29th October. And 15 days so that we could plan to move out our existing vessels from the field, what is chartered, so that you can get them in time. So it was a period of two years because shipbuilding was its peak. Maybe we would have got it at a shorter period. Hyundai were delivering 250 to 300 ships a year. That means on an average, one ship a day. We had about 26 shipyards in India. Pipawa being the latest ship on the block at that point of time. And I happened to visit their facility way back in 2009. It was a phenomenal facility, as good as the infrastructure, the machines, the latest techniques brought in were in line with, at par with global best yards. And what went wrong? They got orders for 30, 35 bulk carriers. They had orders at a high price. They procured equipment, they procured steel, but they could not deliver on time. And then the market crashed on 3rd of December 2008, and the whole hell went loose. The cost of a bulk carrier, Panamax, uh, sorry, this uh, uh, Handymax or uh, Supramax came down from $50 million to 32, 33, 34 million dollars. What happened? Why it failed? There are various reasons. I think Dr. Uh, John, you brought out a lot of reasons very well. And if you do an analysis, uh, we my take on this is that somehow we a we did not have the adequate support from the government. If you see the shipyard shipyard uh, or shipbuilding, always moved from a developing country to a developed country to a, so from. See the country which is developing and then it moves on. And once the country develops, it goes to started off with Liberty class ships in US, in the First World War, where they made ships, I think, in as little time as four to five days on average per ship. It moved to Europe, UK, Germany, high end ships, and then to this uh, Eastern Bloc, Poland, Romania. Quality was not so good, but yes, they made the ships at that point of time. And then it moved to Japan. And Japan dominated for a couple of years. It moved to South Korea. And from South Korea, it moved to China. And the natural move should have been to India. So it moved to China sometimes in late 90s, early 2000. And by 2005 or 6, they had 1,000 odd shipyards. And greenfield shipyards, which they would sort of uh, make it in a couple of months, as the infrastructure is coming, they would get the steel. And it was, like I said, like you still mentioned, it's not a rocket science. But we could not replicate, replicate any of these things in India. The government provided the support. Uh, government gave some subsidies. 
the finance was available at one or two percent. The ancillary industry, which supports the shipyard and which creates a lot of uh, employment, uh, you take the case of mine engines or generators or boilers, the Alborg or the MAN or BMW. All of them set shop over there because they see a thousand shipyards. The whole world orders are coming there. They already had set up uh, facilities in Korea and Japan. With India, with 26 shipyards, most of the shipyards of a very smaller size, barring three, four government shipyards, which are more focused on the defense production, Pipawa, uh, LNT, these were being looked at as a future, which will be set the example. But something drastically went wrong somewhere. Uh, they were supported for, for the orders from all over the globe. Now let's see what are the biggest hindrances. Firstly, I'll just give you an example of Pipa of Shibyan. They put up a Goliath crane of two cranes, 600 tons each. And that was supposed to be one of the bigger, no, sorry, I, I think it was 1200 tons each or 600 tons each, I don't recall. The Indian government did not give permission to the Chinese technicians to come and commission it for eight to 10 months. And in the meantime, the shipbuilding cycle changed. Number two, the government had announced a subsidy, shipbuilding subsidy to promote shipbuilding in 2002. And for the first time, Indian shipbuilding picked up from 0.3% up to 1.7 or 1.8 or 1.9%. And when the shipbuilding was at peak in 2007-8, the carpet was, the rug was pulled out and they said no subsidy. That made shipbuilding a little more unviable again for all our Indian friends, Indian shipyards, who were all very keen. They had the uh, fire in their belly, but then their fire, fire was doused because banks won't, won't come forward. Government withdrew the support. Uh, labor was an issue because your completion time uh, was almost two, two and a half times of any of the foreign yards. Let's give credit to some of the yards at that point of time. Bharti Shipyard led by late uh, Mr. Vijay Kumar, one of, the one of the very fine shipbuilders in India. While ships were being built for, our Indian ships were being built in Norway, the offshore vessels. The Norway had placed order with Bharti Shipyard for uh, the highest end uh, anchor handlers, which were of, uh, of the high, best possible design. And they were delivered on time and they mentioned these are the finest vessels. We had the capabilities, but we didn't have the capacity. They too brought in a shipyard from UK, full lock, stock and barrel. Had the subsidy continued, perhaps 1.7% would have grown to 4%, but within two years, it collapsed back to 0.2 or 0.3%. Now, a shipyard like Pipawa Shipyard, which had orders, 30, 40 well carriers, some of the orders got cancelled. They had already ordered the main engines, they had ordered the generators, they had ordered the steel. So they had to slow down the production because they, and they had to sell these ships at a little, much lesser market price prevalent at that point of time, 32, 30, 33 million dollars. I was associated with them and I assisted them in selling some of their ships to Norway and other places. But that was a pity that a shipyard which had 144,000 tons capacity, much more than all the 26 shipyards combined. I still feel since they were deep into defense production and the Indian defense requirement is so large, probably the government should have stepped in and taken it as a defense yard because the equipment and machinery, etc. was absolutely phenomenal. Why these shipyards went down is a mystery in the sense that circumstances made these ship owner, ship builders to borrow more money. They defaulted on payments. Some of them went to liquidation and they were like you showed on, also on your slide, which was a pity. But uh, 
I'm not sure whether shipbuilding can come up in India again or no. We must try and MIV 2030, Chapter 5, speaks a lot on the shipbuilding. And if you see, they have done a very good analysis. Uh, Shipyard Association, uh, I see a couple of my colleagues, Mr. Goel and others are there in the... We were interacting with the government and the PwC were our advisors to the ship, Shipyard Association of India. And the entire world study was done. How Vietnam is coming up? What was the China model? What is the Korean model? What is needed? If this much support comes, perhaps the ship building would take up. But A, the decision making has been very slow. B, uh, our costs were high. The main reason being you had an import duty on steel. The ancillary equipment, what you bring, your freight will increase because none of these ancillary uh, the main engine that they wanted to set up a shop in India because the critical mass is not available. Had this country had the facilitation of, you know, easy import and export, perhaps this could have still worked, but they felt that there'll be bureaucracy will not make their project very, very viable. So they refrain. Uh, this would have generated so much of employment. It would have, so many industries would have come up, so much... Uh, you know, it, has, it would have contributed to our GDP. Somehow, this did not happen. If we go by what MIB states, I think we still have a future. We have a good future for inland waterways, which is bound to pick up. Environment concerns are also in favor of shipping being picking up more. As you know, the truckers' lobby was very strong and we had 45 to 50% share of or rather 55-60% of share by road, which is very skewed because the rest of the world is 30-35%. And anything beyond 300-400 kilometers, uh, uh, rail is a better uh, uh, substitute or a waterways if waterways are there. But we do 1,400-1,700-2,000 kilometers all by road because road becomes cheaper. The rail was overstressed. The railway lines are of the British time. They cannot take the required load. But see the change coming in from 17% in 2021, we are 27% today and likely to go to 45% because of the dedicated freight corridor coming in. How does it impact the multiplier impact? You had a, let's take a container train, which was 750 meters. It would have 90 uh, rakes and 90 containers. So first thing that was done was the Rakes, it, the uh, the uh, this thing, uh, the train was made to 1500 meters from 750 meters, so it became 180 containers, and then they said we need to do uh, uh, double decker, so it became said with 360 uh, containers. That means four times multiplier effect, and the average speed what we used to get on these old trains and with passenger trains getting priority, you would get an average speed of 30 kilometers per hour. With the dedicated freight corridor getting commissioned into 2023 and 2023 or by 2024 to a large extent, the trains will go at a speed of 70 kilometers per hour. So your multiplier effect is going to be eight times. We need to have some replication of like this in the ship building and shipping. Uh, now coming on to cabotage and support for Indian built ships for the carriage of cargo within India. A very good move. I was CEO of Indian National Ship Owners Association. We pushed this with the government. Uh, we succeeded to some extent. But then take the case of a ship owner or the, your freight. If you are placed an order for a shipyard with a shipyard in India, your delivery period is, say, two years for a small vessel. China will give it in eight months. If the cost is... $5 million in India, it will be 2.4 or 2.3 million. The classic examples the tug was costing $10 million in India, 4.6 million or 5 million in China. Uh, off the shelf, when we, are, when we started this, we were talking about the containers being built in India. I said, yes, there were container manufacturers. Critical mass was not there. And the cost was almost 1.7x. 
So obviously, similar thing goes for the shipping. There are two factors with which a ship owner, because I've been a ship owner as a shipping corporation of India for a long time and represented uh, Indian National Ship Owners Association. When they place an order, like I give you an example of a container ship in 2006, delivery in 2008, you have worked your economics that in 2008, the freight rates are likely to be X amount. The demand is going to be X and these vessels will be good for next 10 years and then the larger vessels will keep coming in. If you delay by one year or six months or there could be a loss of demand by that time, that trade may not, you know, the external forces, geopolitical or so that ship is going to make a loss. And that's the reason you have, uh, you know, a refundment guarantee and the orders get cancelled if you don't. So Indian shipyards somehow did not have the track record of delivery on time. Uh, they had their own challenges, getting equipment from abroad, custom challenges. I hope MIB 2030 answers this to quite an extent. Since the time is short, I would now a little bit jump onto the ship build, uh, ship repair. I'll just take two to three minutes on this and then I'll pass on the mic back. Ship repairs. SCI had a fleet of 100, 120 ships, Great Eastern had 40, 50 ships. Every single ship had to go to China for dry docking or to Colombo, nearby Colombo. What was it that what we could not do over here? We had dry docks coming in at Chennai, floating dry dock. We had it at Goa. It didn't work out. Why? We do not know. We don't have the, uh, you know, professionalism or this thing to take it in a serious manner. So big money and big uh, revenues, and it's not a rocket science. We had did not have enough dry docks. There was one dry dock in Mumbai, in Bombay Port Trust, Meriwether dry dock. Worldwide, these dry docks last for 200, 300, 400 years. This dry dock was converted, this was filled in, and it was closed despite representation. And all these 200, 300 odd vessels, which would, uh, some of them find a dry docking space in Bombay, now had to travel to Dubai or to Colombo or other places. So the vacuum has been created over there. I'm also associated with a port where we plan to take a single lift and try and then this adjacent to uh, GNPT to address that issue. Again, it's uh, what we need to focus on is timely production of ships in case we have to go forward and we have to go forward. There's no two ways. If the whole world is looking at India for everything else, every development, shipbuilding and ship repair has to come. And I think all of us in this group have to be aggressive. We have to make a start. And the maritime vision, we have to keep pursuing against all odds with the government to again give us a subsidy, ensure that you get infrastructure loans for 15 years at 3 to 4% interest. You have interest, subs, interest subvention. And to make this industry come back, come back again, uh, sir. I think we are a little short of time. I will, if I you allow me to go, I will go on. But I will like to close it over here because I'm passionate about the subject. And uh, I hand over to Dr. Shija Janardhan as well as to Mr. Jyotisman Dasgupta. Thank you, Jyotisman, for inviting me. I thoroughly thank enjoyed you, it. Thank you. Thank you. Coming yeah. back into the it's, it's, circuit after a long time. Yeah. Thank you very thank much. You, thank you very much. Just as a short uh, interruption, I think uh, before we go into the question answers, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Grover, for there have been points, counterpoints, a lot to discuss on this very passionate uh, topic of all the people who are attending this, I, I can see that. But before going into the question answer, I would request uh, Dr. Shija to uh, request Mr. K. Roby, Roby K, R-O-B-Y K. He has he had raised his hand for quite some time. So if he can be given a chance. Um, do we take uh, his question during the question answer? Yes, yes. No, we, we, yes. We, we start with him. Yeah, yeah we start with him then if we, we can. This is uh, actually a question answer session now because both the speakers have uh, finished with their presentation. And uh, we will start with Mr. Robbie K. 
and then we'll go to the other uh, 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 participants who have also raised their questions. So uh, may I ask the organizers of INA to give uh, the uh, access or whatever you call this, uh, yes, a yes, yes. making him as a panelist uh, here, Mr. Mr. Rokike. Yeah. So he can- uh, You uh, can unmute this. yourself, yeah. You can unmute yourself and uh, ask the question or whatever topic you want to talk about. Mr. Lobike, Mr. or Mrs. I don't know. <laughs> can you please unmute yourself? Are you there? Otherwise, probably you can ask the administrator to unmute him. Maybe if he's finding it difficult to unmute himself. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we have given him the permission to unmute, sir, and uh, we're trying it. But I think uh, maybe there's some yeah, connection maybe. issue on his end. Maybe okay, we can take okay. it back if it is okay. Subsequently. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And then shall we start with uh, uh, the question raised by Mr. P.R. Gover? Uh, so his question, uh, can we give him the rights to come on the screen, uh, organizers for my name? Sure, yeah, we, we, have, we have given him. Uh, Mr. Govil, you can unmute yourself, yeah. Uh, thank you. I'm just... Uh, uh, hello? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes please. Uh, yeah. My question is because, you know, the, in uh, our Indian shipyard, we're doing very well during 2001 to 2010. But, uh, and there were about, uh, about a more than a dozen shipyards, out of which six shipyards closed down during the last five to six years. So I would like to know what, what can be the reason for that. You know, of course, uh, Omesha said one of the reasons because she, shipyard did not deliver in time. Is there any other reason you, you attribute? Uh, do you want me to take that question? Yeah. Sure. So uh, I, I think uh, prima facie, there is the level playing field that we talked about. Is that um, when we look at um, major nations with large shipyards, there is usually a protectionist regime where the shipping in the ship, shipbuilding industry is protected, uh, which is not only in terms of uh, providing an ecosystem to plug and play, but also when there is an external distress, that there is financial support provided. So you can see that you know when there is COVID, right? There is a monetary policy or a fiscal policy that changes to address it. Uh, unless that is there, um, it is really not possible with in an industry which has uh, so much of capital outlay and um, is capital intensive so uh, that is that is very much true um, it and with with shipyards which are this competitive uh, in the global environment with such thin margins yes unless you have also uh, a protectionist regime and support from the government it, it would not be really possible it may be uh, good on paper but uh, to make it more practical uh, uh, there should be uh, ease of doing business, as we call it. Thank you, John. Then we have a question coming up from uh, uh, Mr. Kamal Palit. So maybe give him the rights to present himself. And I think the question is to the first speaker, Dr. Joshin John. Yeah, Mr. Kamal Palit, uh, we have added you. Uh, you can unmute and post your question. Palit, sir, you have to unmute yourself. Thank you. 
So if it's written in the in the QA box, we can probably pick it from there also. Sure. Uh, Mr. Palit, are you able to hear, uh, hear us? Uh, you can post your question. So if it's okay, may I read his question for uh, Dr. Joshin John? Sure, please. Sure, uh, yeah. I think, uh, uh, Umesh, sir, you can also add to the question. Uh, after uh, both of you can compliment each other. Mm -hmm. So uh, this question is uh, uh, to exclusively, uh, especially addressed to Dr. John. Dr. John, I fully agree with you that the development of ship ancillary industry is very important for ship building industry. But what is your view of draft restriction, particularly on the East Coast? How can we build large ships in India? He also has another question. Most of the shipyards in foreign countries, Korea, China, Germany, build, manufacture, or large ship machinery and equipment. But in India, such facility does not exist. GRSE tried for some time. They did not succeed. In India, we tried with many industrialists, but they did not support. What is your advice? Uh, I think both the speakers can address these questions. Over to you, sir. Start with Dr. John. Sure. All right. Now, on the other question of draft restriction, yes, I think uh, if you look at the natural setting of, of the coastline, you can see that there are some areas that are uh, that where there are higher drafts and better natural harbors. Um, you can also have uh, dredging and increase the drafts, but it, it comes to cost. But that's when I when when I um, post on the ecosystem, it is actually possible that uh, there is cooperation between entities that some uh, entities produce certain kind of ships where you may not re really require dredging requirements, but in other places where you have a higher drop, uh, you have uh, deep sea vessels. Uh, and uh, if everybody tries to compete on high drops vessels, right, and uh, probably that's not best for the ecosystem. And I think given that uh, uh, in um, Korea or in, in, in China, where the cooperation is not only between um, shipyards, but also between other industries, for instance, uh, steam and shipyard industry. If you have um, um, asynchronous movement, that is basically increasing to your uh, cost uh, within a national ecosystem. That is on, on A. The second question was on, uh, can, can you please touch upon the question again? Yes, I'll read it for you again. One minute. Most of the shipyards in foreign countries, Korea, China, Germany, build, manufacture, or large ship machinery equipment. But in India, such facility does not exist. GRSE tried for some time, but they did not succeed. In India, we tried with many industrialists, but they did not support. What is your advice? Sure. So I, I think... Uh... Uh, you know, I, I I had when I was looking at uh, some of the Eastern East Asian yards, uh, I also had uh, connect with some of the bigger liners in India, and there has been some um, um, movement to have manufacturers of engines in India to develop engines, right? But uh, you can also see there are pro problems in terms of certification, classification. And, and getting into the, the maritime route, right? Which means that uh, unless the administration also considers uh, growing the ancillary industries, not only at steel production, but also for equipment and outfit, um, this would pave a way that you are only import dependent. Which means that uh, uh, we should uh, look at uh, being able to um, to incentivize industrialists to invest in shipbuilding and aligned, allied equipment. Because as a third party, let's say I am a businessman, um, or if I'm just looking at um, investment in a company, uh, I would look at all the sectors. I would look at the returns. I would look at uh, um, what would be my um, margins, right? And if it is not competitive, and if I know that the conditions are skewed against us, 
um, I would not invest. And that's that's plain logic. Where are you going in the world? Um, can I add on to a little bit of this, uh, Dr. Sija? Yes, of course. I, of course, yes. Please. Thank you. Uh, Palit sir, first of all, nice having you in the seminar. It's a pleasure. Uh, as you all know, Palit sir was my predecessor's predecessor. And I have a lot of uh, regards and respect from him. I've learned a lot from him. Uh, sir, the first part, as far as the ancillary equipment, I think Dr. Joshin has rightly mentioned that uh, one is the business, if process is not viable, no one would like to invest. And why it is not viable is because you do not have a critical mass. Uh, it's a chicken and egg story. Whether the shipyards come first, they start delivering, and then they prove that, yes, there is a enough requirement in India, the ancillary equipment manufacturers would find their way because they'll, they are looking to expand. And they would also not like to import from China or other places if the ships are being in India at a fairly large number. If they are small numbers, it won't work. So coming on to draft restrictions, uh, let's take PIPA, which had a draft only of seven and a half or eight meters. Uh, it was easy to build vessels up to 54, 55,000 tons. As I know, if, as I can be corrected, but even for large vessels, I think what you need is 10 to 11 or 12 meters draft where you can build any size of vessel. Now, if the government has to give a push, there's a lot of, everything has to be port-led development. A new port is coming up, say, let's say, Virginia, or the government should have a rule that, okay, you are taking, a, building a mega port, 20 meters draft, or now you're having Vadaman port coming over here. The first condition has to be that you also have a major shipyard. Look for a partner and make a shipyard. At least, you know, allocate that much of space. So that is the first question that, yes, that is one way we can give it a push. Uh, the big ships, uh, Korea, China, they have, because they are making the vessels of, uh, like, sir, I mentioned, uh, Hyundai makes 300 vessels a year, 250, almost one delivery a day, large vessels. You have seven, eight big shipyards there, Daibu, STX, Samsung, and so on and so forth. The requirement is so large. They have a network of uh, uh, subcontractors. Uh, so it becomes a lot easier for them because it makes business sense for all the ancillary makers, large boiler makers, engine makers to set up the equipment and facility over there. Uh, so another thing, what Dr. John, you mentioned about the, apart from uh, certification and classification, I think the administration now in India has improved a lot, have come a long way. And I think they too would like to facilitate the growth of India. So I don't see that part as a challenge today. And I think that is one part which can, so, but we have other challenges. So this, I don't think will pose any obstacle. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And may I ask any organizers, can we pick up two more questions or uh, it's time for us to go to the summarizing part? Mm -hmm. Uh, if I may, uh, this is a very passionate topic and there are quite a few questions. I would request, uh, you know, all the members to be a little patient and accommodate a few more questions. Yes. Uh, okay. So maybe one from Mr. Naresh Shog, one from Mr. Amarendra, uh, Amarendra from Chennai and Dr. Uh, Ajit Shemai. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I'll three, start with yeah. uh, Mr. Rajay, Das Gupta's. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah. So, can we give uh, rights to Ajit, or do you want me to read his question? No. Yeah. We, we have given uh, rights to him. Uh, uh, Let him ask able to, uh, Yeah, unmute. Uh, uh, yeah, Professor Ajit, if you can uh, unmute yourself and uh, yeah, pose a question. Okay, uh, I've unmuted. Hopefully, you can hear me. Yes, we can hear. Okay, I'd like to compliment Dr. John on what I thought was an excellent presentation and on his explanations of a complex subject in a very simple and easy to understand manner. So uh, for, for an outsider, a novice like me, it was very easy to understand. I'd welcome Dr. John's thoughts as well as Mr. Grover's on whether there is a need 
to link domestic shipbuilding targets to a notional proportion of shipping trade to be carried in Indian built and owned ships. I feel this will require linking of national and possibly state level shipping and shipbuilding manufacturing policies to create clusters similar to that seen in India in the automotive and a few other manufacturing se sectors. So my question is, can this be done in a relatively short span of time, say for example, 10 years? Uh, and can, and this is more important, can the necessary cross-party political will be mustered? I'd argue that we have the technical capabilities, the skilled rate, labor, and the expertise in abundance, but we lack a demonstrable national consensus on the importance of the maritime sector to the national economy and well-being. So your thoughts, both of you. You wanna go first? Yeah, Dr. John, go ahead so that All I right. have Sure. Your views. Sure. So I, I think uh, if you look at uh, the point uh, when you when you're looking at international shipping uh, for the for the major corridors, if you look at transatlantic corridor, if you look at uh, the trans-Pacific corridor, or if you look at uh, this corridor um, uh, from the uh, the Cape of the Cross or down from the Cape of Good Hope or from the Straits of Malacca to Suez. Uh, there are con there are carrier conferences at at, uh, at a very big level, um, and there are set contracts, uh, you know, and those are at a large volume. Getting into that is extremely difficult, and not with shipbuilding at this scale. Um, now, as you mentioned, for the generate the demand that is generated, especially because of the Sagarmala and the port led development and the in increase in traffic on coastal shipping and um, inland waterways. I think it is actually possible to have uh, um, a, a higher building to address that domestic requirement. Uh, and the scale for that is also not too much. Um, but I guess um, there should be um, clusters where you are looking at uh, smaller routes, right? And uh, what are the a PPC, right? PPC is like a, a, a planning and control on what can be produced and what are the requirements. And some of these equipments are probably, you know, diesel electric engines or alternate engines. Some of that are not as as difficult as probably the the ocean liner and that sort of scale. So I, I completely agree with what you have suggested that it, it is possible uh, given the MIB aspirations for coastal and inland waterways. Um, I think I don't have to add anything. Uh, Dr. John has uh, very well explained it. No, nothing further to add. Thank you. Then we uh, shall we move on to the next question, sir? Yes, please. I mean, you are the session chair. Please decide and go ahead. Man. Yeah. So we have a question from the Nare Mr. Naresh Chak. Uh, so uh, he says, sure. uh, uh, on behalf of IME, uh, so should, should we give him the right or? Uh, did, yes, did please. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he can be requested. So he can be requested to join then? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Naresh, if you can uh, hear us, you can, you can go ahead with the question. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hello? We can, we can, we can. Yeah. Okay, my question is this. For the last two years, we have been making representations to the government of India on behalf of INA. <clears throat> we wrote to PMO, shipping ministry, and even to the chief minister of Gujarat. We had used almost all the information given in your paper. This is this we have taken from various sources from publications in the ministry, from the ministry papers, and also from internet. We informed them that the shipping capacity is very low. We also compared with China, Korea, and Japan, and also several other countries, and highlighted 
our low ship building capacity our labor cost is cheaper we also highlighted that we are losing a lot of freight to the foreign lines which come and pick up our cargoes because we don't have so many ships we asked our government to give financial support to the shipyard and also subsidies as they were giving before and also help in setting up new shipyards near our new ports but we did not get the desired response i wonder what else we can do to make the government listen to our representations all right yeah, I, i will probably uh, make a small comment on that and i leave to mr grover <laughs> but uh, i think very valid points you know uh, I, I, for for good reason um, if you look at how the budgeting is done there are also political interests right and uh, um, that is uh, to be considered secondly uh, when you looking at uh, uh, ship building as an industry we have uh, in terms of investments have agreed on the point that unless there is a, a regime which is supporting um, builders especially uh, 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 an industry where is capital back which is capital intensive or you could easily go bankrupt um, there is no way going around it unless you have a long term um, um, vision and also a policy that supports it a but with the new developments on port led development which is and the development of coastal uh, transport and uh, waterways there is a natural increase in demand and that natural increase in demand can be catered by production which may not which may be possible locally than having to uh, to ship across um, transcontinental distances so maybe uh, so when you had made it it was probably the time was not right uh, and even even if the time is right there should be uh, policy support uh, and uh, i i think an, another aspect is with more traffic it's not only building but it's also repair that will come up because all this have to be serviced from time to time okay yeah, quick uh, uh, narish good to see you after a long time uh hello how, how are you uh, uh firstly let me answer let, let me try and address your points what you have raised number one you have said that shipping is of great importance in indian shipping the government does not feel shipping indian shipping is important though they are promoting everything because sitting down in hamburg you can take a cargo for china uh from india and take it that's why all the indian ship owners are paying a dirty dozen taxes additional and they do not wish to if you talk to the chairman of great eastern he said my biggest mistake was to have flagged my ships in india that is not the reason is that it, it is not a priority for them coming on to subsidy like dr john rightly mentioned the budget allocation is in such a way that government have their own priorities uh take defense food production subsidy for farmers that takes a priority and this comes much much below the priority so it is all the in their uh, plans to increase the shipping the seriousness to that impact is not there because they feel the fund should come from the public private participation the private entrepreneurs will come in case a project is viable otherwise nobody is going to burn their money without assurance of returns so that's another big question over there that's it thank you yeah thank you very much so we can have one final question from uh, mr amrit no let's have two two questions one from mr amrit and also from one from mr sobhi sarkar hopefully we are not short of time we can accommodate this too I think uh, Mr. Sauri, uh, Sauri Sarkar uh, really doesn't have a question. He is trying to give us some, uh, you know. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this Captain Amrit Mishra. My question was that the cost of capital in India is too huge to make it viable. You know, and uh, to address this, for example, if somebody is making a ship abroad, he has to he gets 
borrowings at a rate of 2% for less. Whereas our people have to borrow at minimum 8, 9%, 10%, 12% and all. So if we cannot, uh, you know, have a system of the funding from within, we should think of allowing the, the you know, uh, people who want to build the ships to fund it from abroad. You know, if there are some, some bankers and lenders who can lend at 2%, so one exception can be made this industry because without that kind of capital, I don't think it will ever start, you know. And one more thing was, we are talking about the water-based opening opportunities. But RSV class 2 vessel specifications, if you look in the market, you will not find. So whereas the government is gung-ho about uh, inland riverways and how to promote it and all, why are we not looking at the realities of it? You know, and we need to start small. We, can, we should not start off thinking that we'll build VLCCs and supramaxes and all that. Let us start with small tugs and small barges and small inland vessels and then scale it up. And third thing, till date, uh, you know, the spares, I was out at sea for 18 years and I had the same issues until today also, if you want to import some machinery and connect it to the vessel, it is very difficult. Customs and all, if the vessel sails out, you are stuck up with the machinery and all and you don't know what to do with it. When so much things are being done to simplify the process, why not address this? That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think we we don't need to uh, reply to this. It's not in our hands. So Mr. Sarkar, you wanted to say something? Yeah. Uh, thank. First of all, I must compliment Dr. John for his excellent presentation. And of course, Jyotishma and you for selecting such a topic. And Grover Saab, listening to you after a very long time. I just wanted to add some commercial sense to... Uh, shipbuilding in India, having been involved in an end-to-end -end process, right from tender to delivery. I just wanted to put two things across to you guys. You know, we talk about big ships. Let's talk of a bulk area, which is, let's say, handy size. It's got 12,000 tons of steel. My aim is to do four bulk areas a year. My turnover has to be $100 million, let's say, for a yard. Okay. So I need to churn out 48,000 tons of steel a year. Can you tell me a shingle shipyard in India who has done 48,000 tons steel per year? That is 4,000 tons per month. I haven't seen shipyards in India doing more than, let's say, 1,000, 1,200 tons of steel per month. The reason why I'm talking about this is this all depends on the way we look at shipbuilding. Is the subcontracting process the correct way? For example, in India, you know, we are very scared about having our own people because that leads to more complications, etc. We go, we rely on subcontractors. And then we say that the subcontractors, you need to produce, you need to produce, you need to produce. We've all emulated all over the, we've seen Korean technology, Chinese technology, etc. But we have never been able to sort of produce that sort of money to commensurate to the turnover. If you go to Korea today or China, you know, shipbuilding is not a problem of one. It's a collective problem of the entire society. If you, let's say, go to Dewu or if you go to Koji or wherever, you will see in the evening, you know, a host of people all along, you know, going around in the markets, etc. They're all so passionate. His problem is the whole uh, shipyard means the community's problem. You know, unless we overcome these and make shipbuilding a commercial sense, it would be very difficult for us to progress as far as commercial shipbuilding goes. I just wanted to add a commercial perspective to it. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I we think can we, take, can uh, we can that. take one more. There is one special comment that does not come in the question and answer session. Oh, sure, 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 sure. Chat. Yes, that yes, is yeah. from my, my ex boss, uh, Mr. Apurva Kaur from the Indian Register of Shipping, is retired now. He just wanted to make a statement and can we have this? Sure. And also, Captain. Mr. Sure. And can... Yeah. Okay. We'll then go to yes. Captain Anil Kumar also. 
Yeah, thank you, Sujaya. And uh, as a great compliments uh, to Mr. Grover, Mr. John, and uh, Mr. Dasgupta. And in, in continuation with uh, what Mr. Sovi Sarkar has made a statement, I just, 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 just my one, my expression is, you know, shipbuilding, some, often we basically mix up with the infrastructure. I think in, in my opinion, it is a highly technical area. Though Mr. Grover has, Mr. has said that it's not a rocket science, but it's definitely a science. It's a big science and a really high tech area. Because these days, uh, ships you are becoming more and more sophisticated. And you know, all sorts of uh, technical know-hows are required for the modern day shipbuilding and ships. So uh, I think if you can recognize at least in the beginning that this is a highly technical area, so that that will encourage the talented people in India, talented pool in India to really join shipyard. Because in the name of shipyard, the youngsters, they think that, oh, that's a steel fabrication, right? There's a lot of noise and a lot of dust. You know, at least to get rid of that sense that it is as good as rocket science or the space. It's nothing less. Because if you go to the, in the detailed technical area, it is actually very complicated. Because we have uh, we have done a lot of shipping, but you know shipbuilding, sophisticated vessels, still we are yet to make. So then we realize that you know a lot of uh, uh, things insights are required and a lot of technological uh, equipments are required. So I think if we can give a recognition to that extent, uh, it will have a sort of a, a, a higher status in the society, and in the society will recognize it's really really a technical area. That's just my submission. Thank you. Sorry, sorry to disturb you here. It's okay. A out of the way. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, I, I think I completely agree to the fact that it is a science, but uh, we are not talking about building FPSOs. We are trying to talk about bulk carriers and container shipping, shipping which is definitely possible. And uh, it is a science. There is a, a great appreciation for science uh, of the naval architects of it. And it's a, it's a promising area, but we hope the naval architects build ships in India not having to go abroad to make these ships. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Captain T. Anil Kumar, uh, do you have anything else to add? Because I don't see a question coming from you. It's only a, uh, you know, uh, thanking the speakers. Thank you, ma'am. I just want, there's a, a observation or a comment which I would like to think and to try. So and you're coming very much. low. Your volume is low. Can you please uh, increase your volume, sir? Can you hear me now, sir? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. I just wanted to give you a little, uh, try to end this on a more positive note. I have a, a background from the Indian Navy. So from the time that I joined the Navy, uh, I've seen the shipbuilding program in the Navy move from the construction of the Leander class frigate. And eventually today we have launched our uh, aircraft carrier from the Cochin shipyard. So I would like to think that it's a matter of time and uh, with the government uh, at the center uh, becoming a little more mature and uh, more aware, I think the political will will come and uh, eventually we will come up to the standards that we all aspire Indian shipbuilding and uh, the ancillaries would attain. Uh, with that, hmm. I say thank you and uh, for a wonderful uh, the insights provided by both the speakers, Dr. John and Mr. Grover. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So I, I think I would just want to compliment that is probably some of the shipyards that have been surviving is probably because of the defense orders and the attractiveness of the defense orders. So I think for whatever is there as a backbone, the naval orders have been very important. But uh, the, the point we are also trying to make it is that if we have the political will and the policy change to make it also commercially viable, um, not necessarily to look at China, but probably do better than Vietnam. Um, I think uh, that would be a good start. And maybe it's to start small, as some of you have already mentioned. Thank you. So if we, we are, I think we are left with no more questions. Uh, we can quickly uh, go for summarizing this entire event. So I take this opportunity to put everything in a capsule as much as I can without taking much time. Of course, we had a very educative and information informative session. Uh, Dr. Josh and John, you took us through a journey of, um, you know, realizing our dreams, but the hurdles we are facing. 
and uh, it was uh, very well reviewed by uh, Mr. Umesh Grover. And I would like to put your uh, views in brief. So uh, Dr. Uh, Joshin John took us through the uh, hurdles of the shipping industry, as I mentioned. Um, so it uh, tells us why India is incurring such high cost on logistics while compared to other countries, despite the waterways being one of the cheapest mode of transport. And he attributed those uh, uh, high costs to some uh, 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 problems we have here. And those are uh, the uh, mostly the delays. Uh, and he says the delays could be uh, mainly because of the inadequate infrastructure, higher turn around time, and uh, lack of proper connectivity, lack of multimodal transportation, lack of transshipment, and not, we don't, do not have many deep draft ports. We don't have many ship repairing yards and freight forwarding also lacks proper uh, attention. And we also lack uh, hinterland connectivity. So uh, this, all these makes, uh, you know, uh, India hold a uh, very less share in this overall ship production. And he also says that the policies uh, the, that the government has given us, the ambitions and the models the uh, government has given us, uh, has a little more, uh, will take little more time to realize them because of some of the, uh, some of the uh, difficulties that those have been mentioned uh, uh, just a while ago. He also presented his research observations uh, during the period 2010 to 17. Uh, from some top uh, performing shipyards in the world, uh, comparing where we stand. And he also presented three perspectives to understand these. That is from a country perspective, ecosystem perspective, and a shipyard perspective. And he also compared and contrasted the annual output in terms of DWT and the net profit margin of the major shipyards of India. He also listed out the checks for checking the line of balance whether we are on the right line. And he also showed us the place of India in the shipbuilding universe. He also put forth a big queue for maritime fertility as shipbuilding. And um, as our outputs are not on par with the road rail or the space vehicle production. On a concluding note, he suggested a transition to green technologies. And he also gave us uh, a hope to be get inspired from the history and our ancient uh, maritime trade. So while uh, he addressed all these hurdles and giving us a hope to advance uh, further, our chief guest, Mr. Umesh Grover, uh, started with his opening remarks of saying that now in India, it's easier to build rockets than ships. He shared his vast experience with SEI, where you know lack of support and lack of proper subsidiaries resulted and uh, gave a major economic loss during his experience. He also brought out the need for supporting ancillary industries, financial support and subsidiaries, and emphasized that we can't do anything without capacities if we only have capabilities. And this has affected the growth of Indian shipyards. So he has cited some reasons that is re really holding us back. Those are the decision-making, import duty on steel, and no, no proper track record of delivery on time for Indian shipyards. He also says that he sees good future for the inland waterways and the dedicated freight corridors by Indian railways and the concept of building in India. He looks forward to the models uh, put forth in MIV 2030, comparing uh, with different countries and which paves uh, a new ray of hope for India to march forward. And uh, while uh, embarking on ship repairs, he says that uh, uh, we have been depending too much on China and Sri Lanka for uh, uh, dry docking. We have really need for a good number of dry docks in the country and is really looking forward to the Indian shipyards to come back to action uh, uh, with, you know, a positive note on uh, India uh, again emerging as a shipbuilding niche. And when we took uh, the questions from the audience, we had really interesting questions. Most of them were uh, 
concerns. The concerns range from uh, shipyards uh, closing down, deep drop facilities, lack of ship ancillary manufacturing, uh, reducing shipping time, representation to the government, importing space and machinery, and the limitations of the Indian capacity. And we uh, concluded the questions also on a positive note of uh, some important uh, uh, strides India has made, especially the uh, recent uh, aircraft carrier by Indian Navy. And as uh, a participant uh, of this program, I would also add that we are also building autonomous ships. That's another positive note. So with this, I say, I, I say I've done my work, I've summarized, and uh, now uh, I thank the organizers for giving me such a great opportunity, an opportunity to hear to the stalwarts in the field and an opportunity to be among many stalwarts attending this online. Some of them have been my mentors. So thank you, INA. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And over to you, INA. Thank you very uh, much. I would also yes. like to, to uh, express my gratitude to INA, uh, President Mr. Gujisman, uh, uh, Global Sir, and Dr. Shija, and all the participants who have um, attended this discussion. Um, to have us here and to make it a very uh, lively discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very Just much. Back to what Dr. John has said, I won't speak anything more. Exactly the same was from my, my side. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's my duty now to thank uh, everyone here. Uh, let me begin with uh, thanking uh, Mr. Grover. I have known Mr. Grover for many, many years, maybe 30 years now, uh, since my days at Indian Register of Shipping. And uh, I'm very grateful to you, sir, for making uh, time to share your knowledge and experience with us. I uh, give my sincere thanks to Dr. Joshin John, whom I personally have been following for a number of years, uh, his articles, his publications. And uh, I have noted that he has a completely different uh, view and a very different way of looking at shipbuilding and uh, ship repair facilities as well as the industry there, associated industry. So I thought it would be uh, very good for all of us uh, here to listen to him and understand his way of thinking. And I'm grateful to you, Dr. Shija. Uh, you have summarized it so succinctly and so comprehensively. It is indeed a pleasure. I mean, you have given the full discipline of an educator to really cover the entire topic. Thank you so much. And my sincere thanks to all the participants who have attended our webinar today. It has been a great uh, privilege for us to discuss this very passionate topic of naval architects on a, on a, on a comprehensive forum. I do have my uh, personal points to talk about. If I am given just two minutes, I'll just share my thoughts. Uh, my personal point, number one, is uh, I'm somewhat, uh, you know, kind of peeved, if I may use that word, that the national maritime policy, which was supposed to have been reviewed in 2022, we haven't heard anything about it. And we don't know as to in which direction it is, it is going, nor do we have any idea about uh, any bill being prepared, because it was published and it has been uh, there for the past 10, 12 years. And we hope that it will have some scope for the shipbuilding and associate industry to come up. Uh, number two is, uh, okay, uh, we, we need to differentiate between principles and rules. I think we are very much governed by rules uh, and uh, rules of you know, how you can do it, how you cannot do it. And uh, we have possibly not be able to uh, stick or see the basic principles. And that is possibly what is uh, preventing the government to take the, the pause that be to take notice of the enormous potential and the need that the shipbuilding industry holds. Because frankly speaking, with the kind of geo geopolitical situation and the geographical boundary that we are restricted in, uh, the only way out to reach the outer world on a terrestrial uh, basis is to the seas. And that is where we have to 
grow further. And with this, I, uh, and lastly, we are at an inflection point, somewhat similar to possibly early 1800s, when the first, uh, you know, steam powered vessel was uh, launched, shifting the sh uh, ship powering from uh, sails to steam powered vessels. We're coming to a similar kind of a situation requiring a complete change in the outlook and possibly a shipping perspective. So it's something that we have to look into uh, for the commercial shipping to sustain. I'm not going to talk, I'm not talking about the uh, naval ship building or naval ships at all in this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much again. And we look forward to see all of you again soon. Best regards.